Y'all, I love the opportunity um, to be here with you guys. Thank you first and foremost for even coming, for giving of your time and your attention. I know you just want the course credits, but it's also cool because we got to come to a really cool place and we get to spend time together. And um, I'm just blessed to be out here. I'm also winded from that jogging because of the elevation. And I have a sinus infection, so if I have to blow my nose a few times, just bear with me. Um, but yeah, we're... We're thrilled to be here. You will see my whole family all around until, I think, Wednesday morning. My husband, Jeremiah, he's six foot five. He's hard to miss. Just a real treasure. Ladies, you'll know what I mean when you see him. He is the greatest blessing. He's an incredible man of God. He loves Jesus, um, and he leads our family really well. We've been married about five years, and we have three kids to show for it, so this is why I write about sex. Um, it's... <laughs> what happens. And then we have a four-year-old who is four feet tall almost, because I'm 6'1", my husband's 6'5". She's gigantic, um, and she's amazing. Her name's Auden. We have a two-year-old named Asher who might throw herself off the side of the mountain. She's very adventurous and reckless. And we have a seven-month-old named Ronan who, if you make eye contact with him, you will melt. It's inevitable. He's precious. He has these big eyes and these cute dimples. And I'm not saying he's my favorite, but it's like, Yes, he is. Um, He's so sweet. And my girls were both 10.1 pounds when they were born, and he was just a rogue seven pounds. So I was like, my man, this is a good thing. Um, But no, it's an an absolute privilege. Our family gets to travel the country and and internationally as well, sharing the gospel and um, sharing testimony and speaking about topics and conversations and pieces of our lives that are so integral and massive and great staples of our humanity, and yet the church is often afraid to talk about them, or we're quiet about them, or we've bought into the taboo nature of them, or um, we don't know what to say or how to say it, and so we choose to say nothing at all. And this started, um, it was actually really neat getting to walk around and read some of y'all's, I guess, life graphs, what do you call them? Journey lines, got it, cool. Um, Yeah, it was neat to walk through because all of this started, um, this whole ministry thing, this whole speaking, teaching, sharing thing was never, ever what was planned. Um, I grew up in a Christian home with wonderful parents who worked really hard to instill in me what it meant to be a godly woman. But I was an athlete, I was a competitor, I was performance-based, I was stubborn, and so really what it meant to be a Christian was... Um, showing up to church, getting my Jesus points, um, church on Sunday, maybe Bible study on Wednesday, working really hard to be a good person, knowing a lot about God, uh, but I did not know God. And um, I never would have imagined in a million years that ministry would be a part of my story because uh, that weak foundation of faith led me through young life where it's not too hard, um, especially in the Bible Belt, to, to grow up claiming Christ, but then when challenge actually happens and adversity comes, um, it tests the the foundation you're standing on. And so identity issues came for me in high school, which manifested into eating disorders. Um, Anorexia evolved into bulimia, evolved into a combination of the two conditions. Uh, That gripped me for several years. Perfectionism and anxiety and struggles with depression. Then I headed off to college, and after my uh, freshman year, my dad put a gun to his heart and pulled the trigger. And so suicide entered my story very unexpectedly, no warning signs. I was this all American athlete. I was a soccer player at LSU, go Tigers. We're going to win the national championship. It's no big deal. Um, <laughs> but I was this all American soccer player at LSU and had scored this 90 yard goal freshman year and made sports and it was this incredible, big, exciting thing. And everyone was looking at me all eyes like I was this leader on campus much like you all are learning and growing and understanding what leadership truly is, and yet behind closed doors, my life was absolutely falling apart. I'd struggled with identity issues, kind of come out of that, then the man who defined love for me, my understanding of a father, goodness gracious, what it frames of our understanding of a heavenly father, bailed and abandoned and took an easy way out when things got hard. 
And so suicide entered the story. I'm depressed. I'm anxious. I'm back on campus. And really, I'm, uh, we could win like Academy Awards, couldn't we, for what great actors and actresses we are. We're so great at faking fine. And yes, we're doing well, and we're recovering, and things. oh yeah, soccer's my outlet. Yet I am depressed, I'm anxious, I'm self-harming, I am out living the college life, right? What looks normal, the parties, the alcohol, drinking, boy, any sin-sized piece to fill the God-sized hole in my heart. I indulged in and I tried, and what's terrifying is that it looked no different than the college experience, yet I was deeply suffering. And I wonder how many of our peers around us look no different really than the college experience, but are deeply suffering, even people in this room who look like they're just doing the college thing, but there are catalysts at the root of all of our behaviors and all of our lives really are a reflection of what's going on in the heart. And so I was promiscuous as all get out. I'm going to share a little bit about that today as it just speaks into even leadership, but I sought anything to numb the pain that I was dealing with. About a year after my dad had passed, I was headed home from Baton Rouge to Atlanta for Thanksgiving break, really at a breaking point, very resentful, very angry, very burnt out, really understanding why my dad did what he did and seeing it as a viable option. And the cry of my heart was, God, if you're so real, do something. Because I don't know, I don't believe you're a healer and a redeemer and just trust to him. All these things I'm hearing and these people trying to love me well, I don't feel it. I don't know that. I haven't experienced that. So if you're so real, God, you do something. Reveal yourself to me or else wreck my life and, and end everything. And let's just cut this show out. And um, a disclaimer, dangerous prayer to pray. He will respond. He's not concerned um, with your comfort or... <laughs> your religion, or your life story. He will wreck your life to save your life and save your eternal story. He loves you that deeply. And so I was headed home on the interstate, lost control of my vehicle. That was a good note one. Everyone's like, I'm going to tweet that. You don't have to tweet or Insta any of this. I hope it retains in your heart. Write it down so you can remember some of these principles because I only get 50 minutes and there's something I would scream from a mountaintop my whole life long if people's ears would care to hear. I'm headed home from Baton Rouge to Atlanta crying out really at the end of my rope. And I was headed down watching the lines just flick by and suddenly realized I'd lost control of my wheel. And it's in the center median and I'm like, what is going on? Snap out of it. I try to pull my car back on the interstate, shot straight across, hit an embankment, flipped three times and landed upside down in a ravine at 1.30 in the morning, completely alone and completely physically broken. One year prior, I'd been completely emotionally broken. And now I hung there with broken ribs, neck, damaged lungs, liver, jaw, face, upside down in my seatbelt choking up blood, and it was hanging upside down in this wreckage, that I get goosebumps, and I've been telling this story for nine years straight, the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit of a real and true and merciful and loving and living God entered into that wreckage, and the weight of his glory and his majesty, I don't know if you've experienced it, if you haven't, Oh, every day long for his presence because the weight of his glory was as crushing and overwhelming as it was soul resuscitating. I was encountered by a king who downloaded the depths of the gospel into me with just a whisper. It doesn't have to take flipping your Jeep onto the interstate. All it really takes is a humble heart saying, I want to draw near to you. Would you make yourself real to me? Draw near to me. And God is joyful to respond. And I encountered Christ. Well, I've almost used that my whole time with just my intro. Sorry about that. But it was incredible, amazing, profound. Everything shifted, and I crawled out of that wreckage. There was one man who'd been on the interstate that night and just vaguely seen lights flicker because it was like 1.30 in the morning, and he just felt compelled to pull over and see what it was. Ended up being a retired paramedic and in the Navy, like a guy with a kit, like, how can I help? It's like, how? Of all things, Lord. He just enjoys showing off if we'd have eyes to see and ears to hear. And this man told my mom he climbed down and shined a flashlight into the, into the car. It was upside down in this ravine, and he told her he was preparing himself to see a dead body, and instead the flashlight caught my face, and I was smiling. And he's like, oh, God, like, are you okay? I mean, I'm bleeding. I'm fractured, broke. I can hardly speak. But he said, all I kept repeating over and over were three words. God is beautiful. 
God is beautiful. God is beautiful. And he's like, that's great. But if your neck looks broken, so if you could maybe move this way, the car might go aflame. And I'm like, nah, brother, God is beautiful. (laughs) You don't get it. (laughs) And I had to go home and, and heal over Christmas break and come back. And it was undeniable. He told my mom, it looked like I had seen the most overwhelming sight, and all I cared to do was tell anyone who would listen about it. And all I've done since I climbed from that wreckage was told anyone who would listen about the King of Kings who sees you exactly where you are, with exactly what you're carrying, and exactly who you've been, and all the things that so define your life and have been the banner over your story for so long. And he says, did you know that you're mine, and I'm yours, and I love you? And I'm here. You choose. Will you continue to let the haphazard winds of life hopefully blow your broken pieces back together? Or will you trust me, the master artist, the one who knit you in your mother's womb, who has plans and purpose for your days? Will you trust me to rebuild you and make you into a new creation? And that is a question some people in this room need to um, hit their knees and and answer. Because it's so incredible to say yes. And it changes everything. And so that was just the intro. Here's the four-part teaching. <laughs> All right. So I want to talk about what they shared with me was the, the theme for today being inspiring a shared vision. And this has become really the anthem and the heartbeat, I would say, of my life. And I would think of any life that has encountered the living water that is Christ, that, that their life would become one that echoes A shared vision inspired by a Holy Spirit who saw them in their sin and their wreckage and their death and said, I died for you, and I want you, and I love you, and I have plans for you. Our lives should naturally echo with inspiration of a shared vision of what is so much greater than even this temporary time here. But if we want to really look at a piece of carrying this out, in our lives, as young people, as college-age students, where again, so much of my life transformation happened in college. This is such an incredible and transformative time. But if we want to look at how that can truly play out powerfully, one piece of the equation is in knowing our identity and is in aligning sex and sexuality in who we are, in what God has knit into us, aligning that with understanding of the heart of who he is and what he has for you and what that looks like, even reflective into leadership. You're like, what does my private life behind closed doors have to do with how I lead this ministry on campus or how business-wise I want to conduct myself? It has everything to do with it because the goal as we are gathered here is as a Christian leader, learning to inspire a shared vision, right? As a Christian leader, we want to learn how to inspire a shared vision. And there's four parts here that if you're taking notes, you can break down. Number one is the goal. Number two is the problem. Number three is the solution. And number four is the challenge. So we start with the goal. As a Christian leader, the goal is to learn how to inspire a shared vision. The reality when you look at even just that short, small mission statement is that you could personally have the most incredible vision. In fact, some of you guys probably do. Who's like a prophetic seer? Who can just like see, you can see it clearly, you have the vision. No one, not a single hand. Nope. All right. Two. Love it. We'll talk after. Okay. So some of us can see it. We can see the vision. We could carry the most incredible, powerful vision. Or we could be the most inspiring communicator. Could we not? You could rope words together and tie them together with a bow and be eloquent. And what does scripture say? That that really is just clanging bells. You could be the most incredible communicator. You could naturally find yourself incredibly gifted, anointed even, in just the natural flow of leadership. You might be just naturally an unbelievable leader. It's not hard work for you. You walk into a room and the eyes and the energy 
gravitates to you. You know how to lead a group. You know how to lead a team. You know how to inspire, how to encourage. All of these things we could have in our tool belt. But every piece of that hangs on the integrity of how you have been set apart and defined as, thank you so much. It's a lot of snot. I appreciate that. All of it hangs on the integrity of how you have been set apart and defined as a Christian. If you want to just be a leader by the world standards, go to another leadership academy, pay $10,000 to go sit and listen to some guru tell you motivational tips and how to pull it all together and make a great PowerPoint and climb your way up the corporate ladder. I'd rather sit at the foot of the cross and hear wisdom and insight from the king of all kings. Because through my life, that's elevated me far beyond anything, anybody's preparation or planning or, or education even has taken them. There is a marked difference in wanting to lead and be a leader. And goodness, look at our culture. It seems of the utmost importance to be followed and to have followers and to have some sway and pull. And then you're a real leader, right? No, it's one thing to desire to be a leader. It's another to mark yourself as a Christian leader. Because all of these incredible tools in our tool belt really hang on the integrity of that truth that you are a Christ follower and also leading. Every bit of it hangs on the Christian piece of that puzzle. And if this is realistically, I'll just be totally honest, I should have disclaimered I'm really blunt and raw. I don't know any of you. I don't intend to hurt anybody's feelings or offend anyone or scare them with half of what I'm going to say in a minute. But I just grew up in the church, and it was all so Christianese, and it was all so comfortable, and it was all crafted just so, and so therefore I learned nothing. So I am very blunt and frank and vulnerable because there's another mark of great leadership if you have the humility to be vulnerable with the most fragile of things. If the greatest fall of man and sin came by the way of pride, the saving of man came by the way of humility. And if the greatest fall, that's also a good one. That was off the top of the head. Maybe Insta that one. Or like tweet it to me. At Moisem. Um, it is the greatest struggle we wrestle with being pride. If that is what catapulting you into leadership, then the greatest blessing you can learn in the middle here is humility. And that is what will cause, compel, provoke others to follow. If you are a Christ follower, if you are realistically claiming to be a Christian, then your identity must fully and firmly be rooted in that truth, or else don't claim it. Don't say you're a Christian if you don't want to follow Christ. Don't build a Christ of your own making and liking. Follow the Christ of the Word of God. Follow the Jesus of the Bible. If you are claiming to be a Christian, the last thing the world wants or needs is another lukewarm hypocrite. The last thing the world wants or needs, the last thing the kingdom of God needs as it is descending upon earth, bringing kingdom come right here on earth as it is in heaven, is another Christian college graduate claiming to live differently who actually looks just like the world. You just want the title, but you haven't set yourself apart. You want the salvation, but you haven't given to surrender. You want Christ, but the word obedience and submission is offensive to you. Well, you might not be a Christ follower. So that's the first important thing to assess. Uh, but if you are, if you do long to know the way and the truth and the life, if you do long to walk hand in hand with the divinity who knit you together and who loves you to the point of death, if that is the way you long to walk, then you will look different than the world. And your leadership will be set apart. If that is the way we walk and lead and share and inspire, then truly the title of 
Christ follower will be one of a surrendered life of obedience and humility and submission and intimacy and reverence before a holy God. Because if it is the other, if it is the counterfeit, if it is the want to lead, but Christ is an accessory, then really at the end of the day, I'll just use blunt terms, it's just masturbatory faith. If God says it is intimacy with me that would lead you to the way, the truth, the life, we're usually like, I would just prefer like the self-serving, self-seeking, like I'll just get the high and the rush and the joy. of It's masturbatory faith. It's self-serving. God says, I long for intimacy with you, and you say, um, I want to do my thing, and you bless me, God. And we want the quick rush, and we want the immediate promotion, and we want leadership to come easy. And it's so cheap compared to true intimacy with God that cultivates a heart, a true leader, that is marked by their profound ability to follow Christ. He's a table flipper, is he not? He comes into the temple and turns everything on his head. He wants to do the very same in your life. You think that leadership looks like being the loudest voice in the room or the smartest or the boldest or the funniest or whatever it may be. Christ is a table flipper. The greatest Christian leaders are the most surrendered Christ followers. You know how to lead the world well because you've been led by the one who saved the world. You know how to follow in step with the Spirit. It will give you a leg up on the competition every time, I guarantee it. You know how to abide in love when it is hard and when it is challenging. You know the pressing place with Christ where he points out what is not so great in you and wants to bring it up so he can refine it. You know the intimacy of following and therefore leading as a Christian is very set apart. To lead well, you must know how to follow. And the answer of the gospel is that to follow means that we'll die to ourselves to be who God wants us to be and to lead God's way rather than our own way. And when this revelation of surrender crashes into our lives, this is the gospel that we meet, then we realize all of our lives come into complete submission and subjugation to Christ. All of our lives come into complete submission and subjugation to Christ to the word of God, and to the the perfect and still and small voice of the Holy Spirit. And this includes sex and sexuality. Darn it, Kevin, I was hoping she'd run out of time and not get to that. No, we're there. Here comes number two, the problem. (laughs) If the call of the gospel is that we would die to ourselves to come alive in Christ, that every piece of our lives would come into subjugation and submission to Christ, then this includes sex and sexuality, who we are made as sexual beings, the decisions we make by way of our sexuality, by way of our lifestyle, by way of our choices. These things, too, are not separate. It's amazing what uh, culture we are of, like, compartmentalized conscience because, honestly, we just don't want the two to collide, right? And I'm going to give you my testimony in a minute, and you'll get it. There's a backstory. So I say all this from a place of understanding. We don't want the two to collide. We're a generation of compartmentalized conscience. Faith, God, Christ, all of these things are over here. Sex, sexuality, me, my choices, in the darkness, behind closed doors, in front of a computer screen. Hey, I'm not hurting anybody else, am I? It's just my pleasure, my thing, my wants. All of this is over here. And we keep those somewhat compartmentalized, and we'd really like to rationalize that they don't touch, yet we know the unbelievable conviction and weight when this is all off because it inevitably bleeds into this being all off. We feel distant from God. We don't feel like we're hearing from God. We live in our shame and our guilt, or we're dehumanized, desensitized to anything of matter because we get what we want right when we want it, and life is all about us. And we compartmentalize these things until repercussion happens or the bad breakup happens that affects life here, or the pregnancy happens, or the abortion happens, or the the addiction comes to the forefront, or whatever it may be, and these two things suddenly collide, and what do we do? We blame God. All the hardship I'm going through right now. 
the weight of all of this stuff I'm messing with and dealing with. And, and God, if, if you were so good, why would you let this happen? We blame God when these two things collide because what's happened is that we've bought into what the world says about sex and sexuality. We bought into the taboo nature that's been wrapped around it. We have looked to a world and a culture that is twisted and cheapened and perverted and worshipped and idolized sex. They've made it a screaming match that their voices all get to be a part of, but it's taboo for the Christ followers to speak into. Sex is entertainment. Y'all, I can't even turn on a dog food commercial without it being over-sexualized. It's startling. Everything is sexualized. Everything is dehumanized because we see people as body parts made for our pleasure rather than image-bearing creations of God. The world has taken sex and there's the mantra of test, test drive the car before you buy it. It's your body, it's your freedom, it's your want, it's your choices. The world has taken sex and said, run this maze, figure things out as you go. It's a touch and go, but kind of navigate it through college and what's everyone else doing and what were you exposed to and how does that impact you? And you put your naivety on display, your masculinity, your femininity, your sexuality, it's just fodder, right? And it's the same culture and world that's crying out, hashtag me too. I'm hurt. I'm wounded. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm, I'm impacted so greatly by this. I thought it was my freedom, my wants, my ways, but apparently there's repercussions to all of these things. And so the same world inviting us into a reckless nature of sex and sexuality is the same world wounded by a reckless nature of sex and sexuality. And for just a moment, just the quickest glimpse ever. Don't blink or you'll miss it. The world is looking to the church to say, do you have any hope? Do you have any answers? To the Christians, do you know a better way? Do you know healing? Do you know I'm falling apart? I'm losing it. What do you know? And they look at the church and we're silent. We don't know what to say. We don't know how to say it. We're silent because we weren't educated about it. We don't know what the word of God has to say about it. The conversations weren't had with us, or we're wounded. We've been hurt sexually. Or we misunderstand who God is in light of our sexual sin. Or we're carrying shame because we're actually living in the exact same sin struggles as the world. And we don't think we have any place to speak into it or talk about it. Y'all, if you want to lead, my goodness, we could take a peace, the topic of sex and sexuality, and you could lead for your whole life long in this arena by way of what our culture and our world is struggling with and looking to answers for, but they're looking to us. And we don't really want to say anything. God intended for us to shift a culture because we are look different, yet we're silent because we look just the same. But the truth I don't know if we've ever heard it talked about in this language. Do we know that sex is God's intention? Made by God for man, for woman. The first conversation God had with man involved sex. Well, I don't remember that. I just saw something about Le Leviticus about livestock and it made me uncomfortable. Yeah, things got weird back then. They still do. It's alarming. But the reality is that God's first conversation with man involved sex. Sex was actually God's invention. Sex is actually a gift from God, a unifying and powerful gift in the confines and the covenant of his design. It is a tangler of souls, and it is a weapon against the enemy. What does that mean? It means, I read an article one time. I talked about this couple who lost their, their two-year-old, I think it was, or three-year-old, very unexpectedly, out of the blue. And they talked about the first thing they did when they got the news of this tragedy was they came together and they had sex. And I said, Carol, what? <laughs> I don't understand. And they talked about the fact that in that moment, it was potentially one of the most tragic moments of their lives. And they knew in that moment, they needed, number one, to remind each other, we are one flesh. We are unified in this. 
You are mine and I am yours in our most vulnerable, most broken, most exposed state. We are one. And they needed to remind God, thank you for this act of worship. Have we ever thought of sex in that way? Because it's what it is. In the context of God's design, a gift given by him that's never meant to be burdensome or bad or hard or painful, sex is an act of worship. Outside of his design, it's still an act of worship, but you're not worshiping God anymore. And there's only one other whom you're praising at the altar. That lands hard, but keep rolling with me. Okay, so they talked about we needed to remind God. Thank you for this gift. We are one. Remind each other. We will not soon be divided and put the enemy in his place to remember you don't get to steal, kill, or destroy this marriage, this family, through this adversity. They, they stuck a middle finger to the enemy, for lack of a better word, by saying, no, 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 no. This is hard. This is messy. This is broken. But we are one, and we will press forward. Sex is a weapon against the enemy. But outside of God's design, it is a sword he will steal from your hand swiftly and stab you with. It is a weapon forged against you. Sin. Oh, we don't like that word either. It's like very 2018. We don't really talk sin anymore. It's just like mistakes. Like I'm such a mistaker. I know, Stephanie. But we just make mistakes and then like we work really hard to be a good person. You're a sinner in desperate need of a savior. It's sin outside of the confines of God's design. And we would be wise to repent and turn back to God. His first conversation with man involves sex. And then he gives man the freedom to choose. And what does Eve do in the garden? The one thing she's told not to do, Eve chooses to choose for herself what she wants, what's best for her. She takes of the fruit, she eats, it's pride. Oh, to be like God, to decide for myself. It's my body, it's my wants, it's my sexuality. I think that I should choose for myself. We choose to choose for ourselves. And it only dismantles us from that point forward. And this was so my story. It never started with like this egregious, like, I don't think anyone's like chaste and pure and living faultless and then suddenly wakes up one morning and they're like, 12 guys, today, let's go. It doesn't usually go rogue, except like freshman year, and we won't talk about that. But it is usually small choices, choosing to choose for ourselves what we want, what we think is best, what we like. This is how my story started. I remember going down to my mom's like little red love seat in her bedroom when I was nine. And listen, don't Google this. No one knows the answer. But I was assigned a project, one of those three tri posters. None? No one? Okay. Well, it used to be this thing. And so we had to do this project, and my assignment was on snakes. And it was time to like do my little piece on the reproductive system. And no one knows how snakes have sex. It's a great mystery of the universe. There was no Google, really, at that time. I was nine. I didn't know how to work a computer. So I went downstairs to my mom to ask her how snakes had sex. And I'm sure my poor mom uh, was completely caught off guard because the phrases and the terms I was using um, probably stunned her because what she didn't realize was that Prior to that moment, and mind you, I was only nine, I had had an older neighbor take me down to the fort by the creek in our neighborhood and tell me everything they knew about sex. Natalie, I didn't ask, but I got debriefed in great detail. And some of us have that story, and if it wasn't like the friend that dragged us somewhere and like opened up like porn, it was the uncle or the cousin or it was the abuse, or the molestation, or what we stumbled in on, or any number of things. My heart grieves for the current generation coming up who can hit a wrong hashtag and suddenly be inundated. But she didn't realize Natalie had already told me a lot of very perverse things, and she also didn't realize that earlier that year, too, I had opened the truck door of my dad's little silver truck, and the playing card had fallen out from, like, these wads of trash, basically, that he always kept behind the seats. And I bent down to pick up this playing card and went to shove it back in the truck, and I turned it over, and it was a novelty poker card. It was porn. And I remember at nine years old, sitting and looking at this, and I had no idea what I was seeing. 
but it seared something onto me. The innocence of a child that knows right from wrong many times, and this wasn't my daddy, and this wasn't my mommy, and my mommy was in the house, and why was this my daddy's, and what was this? And I was overwhelmed and felt like I was going to puke, like my stomach was just coming out of my throat. I will never forget how hard my heart was pounding. And I shoved this back into the truck, and I got up in the passenger seat, and then jumped in my dad, and I was very much a daddy's girl. And I sat there in the passenger seat just overwhelmed. And many of you know the first time you came across porn that it seared something on you. And it started this kind of this shame and this embarrassment, but then what happens? Like that weird feeling kind of turns into like intrigue and curiosity and what was that and why did that make me feel some kind of way and what did I even see and why do I keep thinking about it? It's like a siren on the cliffs that calls out to you. It's one of the enemy's greatest tactics against the children of God. How easy and accessible to sit back anonymously. And I remember starting to seek out porn. Nine years old. Y'all, in 2016, in one year, one calendar year, on one pornographic website, and there are hundreds of thousands, one year on one website, we as a people consumed 4.6 billion hours of porn. That is 524,000 years or 17,000 complete lifetimes of porn consumed in one year on one website. That's just unsaved males contributing to that statistic, I'm sure of it. Give me a break. Porn's affecting men, porn's affecting women, porn's affecting children. The average age of exposure right now is nine years old. That's the average. That means there's younger. Well, I'm a grown man and I'm a... 22 and I'm in college, I don't think it's that big of a deal. It has a grip on you and you are enslaved to it if you can't stop it the moment Christ says no more. We are gluttonous and we are addicted and we are overwhelmed. And I wrestled with a pornography addiction for 10 years. And what happens is what we set before our eyes kind of frames the way we start to think and changes our heart a bit and our actions start to overflow and really I even rationalize, well, I'm watching this to learn a thing or two because what happened was on that couch with my mom when I asked her about sex and she was overwhelmed, she sat me down and she started explaining, now, honey, what God intends is that we would be virgins until we're married and I was a virgin and your father was a virgin and I'm sure she had more to say, but I was very theatrical, if you can't tell, and I remember cutting her off and saying, then mother... I too will be a virgin when I marry. And I triumphantly marched out of the room and she's like, oh dear God. But I remember I had made this virginity vow, right? The good Christians are supposed to, right? And the promise ring. And we have made these vain virginity vows and focused solely on virginity but missed the greater call that God is summoning his children to of purity, purity of heart, of mind, of actions, of thoughts. But what if it's just a virginity? It quickly becomes the do this, don't do that. Okay, so then like how far is too far, right? It's like I'm a virgin. I can still say I'm like the Christian virgin, and that's so amazing, and I'm so incredible, and we're so self-righteous. And yet I'm addicted to porn behind closed doors. I'm starting to push the envelope as far as I can with people. Goodness, 14 years old, 17 or 18-year-old senior, I was a freshman, parked next to a construction site. I mean, talk about romance, right? It was my body, my wants, my thoughts, my choices. My parents thought the church was talking to me about it. The church thought my parents were talking to me about it. Nobody was talking to me about it except the world that had a lot to say about it. Does this narrative sound familiar to anybody? And so I'm waving my vain virgin banner, and yet I'm a mess behind closed doors, completely impure, struggling in so many ways. Then my dad put a gun to his heart and pulled the trigger. And if you want to talk about something that will compel you into sexual brokenness, it's just any piece of adversity in your life. Because that physical fix could like distract us for a little bit, right? Or numb the pain, right? And I'm giving away my body in hopes, desperate hopes that somebody will give me their heart. We just want to be seen and known and loved and desired. I remember waking up after a drunken night. These are my BC before Christ days. 
uh, waking up in college and replaying the night in my mind, like totally hungover and like rehashing and thinking through what happened and who was that. And suddenly it was like I sobered up in a millisecond and I thought, wait a second, who was that guy that joined our group at like the beginning of the night? And what had they said about him? What was his name? And I ended up with him in the kitchen at the end of the night. But had they said at the beginning that he was married or that he was divorced or was he separated? Am I an adulteress? Have I been involved now with a married man? Now, Christ would say there's adultery all over our story if we even look at another with lust. But had I physically also carried out adultery? I am the all-American, well-achieving, best-at-faking, Christian, Christ-following, great-grades girl on the surface. And yet behind closed doors, I'm an adulteress. I'm addicted to pornography. I can't say no to anything. I'm completely overwhelmed. How have I fallen so far? And we want to lead so bad. But something is so off in our hearts when sexual sin is at play. And the enemy loves it, that you can't quit it. He loves that he can keep you distracted and consumed and ashamed and overwhelmed. But I get to the point of number three when I have literally five minutes left. I remember coming to know Christ not long after that incident. And he led me to John 4, the story of the woman at the well. And what I love so much about this woman, I saw so much of myself in her, but guys, this is so applicable for you too. We know that when women are spoken of in Scripture, it prophesies the church to Christ, correct? Correct. So it's applicable to men and women alike in many ways. We can learn from everything in the word of God. So many guys I know just skim past the stories of the women, but I think God's saying much more to our hearts. And this woman is out at high noon to draw water because she has a reputation that precedes her. She doesn't want to be seen. She doesn't want to be talked to. She doesn't want to be known. She doesn't want to lead. And Christ is there at the well, and he's sent his disciples into town to get food, and he's gone out of his way into Samaria, and he's a Jewish man, and this was very taboo at the time. Newsflash, Christ is more than willing to be very taboo in your life. And he asked her to draw some water. He speaks to her, and he dignifies her. And she's like, you're talking to me. You're a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan, and you're a man, and I'm a woman, and we don't associate, are you talking to me? And he's like, yeah, would you draw me some water? And I'm paraphrasing here, but I love that she like argues back with logic. She's such a woman too. She's like, um, cause he offers her living water. And she's like, you don't have a rope or a bucket. This well is really deep. It's like, we argue back with Jesus. Do we not? Like, you don't really know my whole story. And also, um, that I can't quit what I'm in and also how much I was wounded and how many people have hurt me and how many hands have touched me and how the uncle or the cousin defiled me or how my father never spoke to me about these things or how it was all of my older brothers who cheered me on in this stuff or how I keep going back to this stuff and I don't love it and I wake up grieving and I know it was empty and I know that God has called me to more but something keeps drawing me back or how I just can't seem to love what I see in the mirror and I need someone to tell me I'm worth something. We love to argue back with Christ and he's like, I've got living water. To a thirsty generation, Christ has living water that we would never thirst again. And when she starts to understand that, it's funny, she wants it. Don't we want Christ? We're like, yeah, that sounds good. Forgiveness of my sin, grace and mercy, that sounds incredible. I'll take that and then be on my way. And he actually stops her and he says, um, could you just first go and get your husband? She said, I don't have a husband and he says, I know you've had five husbands, and the man you're living with now, you're not even married to. 
And what he does at this well is before he pours out that living water so sweetly promised, he wants to pull up and to trudge up the very thing that has written the banner over her life. The very thing that has shamed you or that you're terrified to talk about or that you're imprisoned to or that you feel owned by, the very thing that's confusing you and you're wrestling back and forth. And I don't know what God has to say about it. And some churches say this about it. And some people's opinions are this about it. And I don't really want to do the hard work of getting on my knees and saying, God, who have you made me to be? Because it matters for how you lead. But it's hard. She doesn't want to talk. We don't want that stuff drummed up. It's the first thing he started to drum up in me when I came to know Christ. He's like, we've got a lot of this sexual stuff to work out. And that hurts, and it's hard, and it's uncomfortable. And it's holy. She says, how would you know all this about me? You must be a prophet. And the woman at the well person with a sexually broken story, or at least what we can understand from the context of scripture, a shame weight on her that's overwhelming. The woman at the well is the first person that Jesus explicitly states in the gospels, no, I am the Messiah. I'm the one who's come to save. He's the one who drums up this hard, messy stuff in us so that he can pour out living water. He is Jehovah Rapha, the great physician, He drums up this messy stuff because he longs to tend to it, to wash over it. That like in baptism, we would die to flesh and come alive in the spirit. He can heal you and you will lead better healed than you will wounded and faking fine. Christ did not come so that we could be coping through this life. Christ came to set the captives free. And those who are free are free indeed. And when you lead free, you lead with no hypocrisy on your story. You lead with no shame. You lead with no fear of what could drum up from the dark place, who could say that about what or this, and it could dismantle my position of leadership. Do we not see the church leaders falling left and right around sexual sin? There's a way that that won't even be a risk of touching your story. It's if you'd stand at that well and say, I'd like living water. She's the first person he reveals himself as Messiah to, and she doesn't deny it. She doesn't run off and avoid it. She does run, but she drops her buckets and she sprints back to town with another man's name on her lips. Imagine this. Oh, but this time it's the name above all names. It's the name of Jesus. And many come to believe in response to her faithfulness. She had no intention of leading because she was weighted down by the shame the enemy had just foisted onto her. Oh, but she became really one of the first evangelists of Scripture because she encountered a king who said, I see you and I know you and I still have plans and purposes for you. Oh, your sin, your sexual sin, I detest it. I detest it. I hate it. I hate everything about it. I hate the hypocrisy. These, I'm saying this because these are all the things I had to wrestle with, with Christ. I hate your sin. I hate your hypocrisy. I hate your praise and your prayers when you are bringing forth filthy hands. I want you to pick up your cross and follow me. Abide in me. Obey me. The adulteress to be stoned is caught red-handed. What does he say to her when her accusers have left? I don't accuse you either. Now go and sin no more. Go and sin no more. This is the great commissioning for us if we desire to lead well. Because if we are to call ourselves Christian leaders wanting to inspire a shared vision, then everything hangs on that title of Christian you so embraced. It's not a promotional tool. It's a cross and nails that you take to your life, to your wants, 
to your emotions. Oh, Selena Gomez with your pop hit, the hard ones, what it was. We are like led by our hearts, our emotions. Drag us this way, then drag us that way. We're so high, then we're so low. And this is not any mark of any of these. This is so my life. Our lives are up and down. But he calls us to a steadfast, sober-mindedness, submitted, patient, diligent, trusting, obedient walk that amongst all the highs in life and amongst all the lows in life, we can say, my eyes are set on you. You are my leader. You are my savior. I will follow you. This valley is dark, but there's divine hope because I know you in it. This mountaintop's incredible, but I won't take the promise and the fame and the praise because you are the one who crafted it. Christ, I want nothing more than for you to be glorified in my tragedy and in the glory. And you guys, if we can wrap our heads around the understanding of how imperative it is that every area of our life come into alignment with him, Oh, if we can understand that, we will know freedom indeed, and we will see revival spark over a generation that is hurting and wounded and confused. So the challenge, number four, and I'll wrap, is that you have to choose sin or the sun, the world or the word. Nothing causes us to feel more disqualified in sharing our faith than that voice in the back of our minds reminding us that behind closed doors, we're sinning the exact same way as non-believers. Don't be fooled. You can't serve two masters. This is scripture. And everything done in the darkness will come to light. This is scripture. I want to see a generation of authentic, culture-shifting disciples of Jesus Christ rise up in self-control and surrender. I want to see the term hypocrite dislodged from the world's view of the body of Christ. And I want us to truly reflect his light. I want us to step away from the sin-filled relationship. Seek others you trust to hold you accountable, extend forgiveness, ask to be forgiven, repent, read the word, and etch it on your hearts. Don't allow the enemy to silence you in shame any longer. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Because all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the arrogance produced by material possession is not from the Father, but from the world. 1 John 2, 15 through 16. You are fiercely loved. And God loves you so much. He knows what's best for you. He longs to use you. But sexual sin is a death sentence to a healthy relationship. Sexual sin is a death sentence to integrity in leadership. Sexual sin is a death sentence to the peace that surpasses all understanding. And if you're in it, you know it. You feel far from God. I would guarantee most everyone in here who is in sexual sin in some capacity is wrestled with a feeling of being far from God. Draw near to him and he'll draw near to you. He wants to speak to you. He has plans and purpose for you. He wants to use you as a vessel He knows what's best for you. He desires that you be healed and whole and of sound mind. He desires the fruit of the Spirit pour from your life. And grasping his design and his intentions with sex and sexuality is a key to finding those very things that have felt so elusive. They're not far off. He's closer than the breath on your skin. Repent of your sin and turn back to God. It changes everything. It changes everything. And it doesn't matter what your backstory is. I won't, but I could go into detail of mine. It doesn't matter. Even what my husband and my backstory, even in dating, I was coming out of this intimacy fast. I was doing ministry. I was on stages preaching the gospel. And I was so free of all of these things. And then I met Jeremiah and we didn't set up boundaries fast enough or come around these ideas soon enough. And my self-righteousness caused me to fall back into the pit of sexual sin. And what does scripture say? Better to have never known righteousness 
than to have known it and gone back like a dog returning to their vomit. And it's so true. Because when you know Jesus and you start messing in this stuff, the conviction is overwhelming. Dismantles everything. I felt like a hypocrite on stages. Oh, we're so good at talking the talk, but to walk the walk? I want to stand before him one day and him say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Not away from me. I never knew you. If we know those scriptures in Matt 7, we see that those very people argued back, wait a second, did you not see me perform miracles? We prophesied, we cast out demons. And he says, yeah, but I never knew you. You can lead a multi-million dollar whatever. You could perform miracles, you could prophesy, you could cast out demons, you could do a lot for God. But it will not matter if you stand before him and have not in your life humbled yourself before him and said, create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. Walk with me, teach me, lead me. Oh, when we know intimacy with the Father, there is no doubt we will never fear what we will hear. It will not be, I never knew you. It will be well done. And I think that's what any leader would want to hear.